Welcome to Baptist Medical News Network. I'm Rhonda McRae. Thank you for joining us today. We're talking about breast reconstruction. And so to help us today, we have with us plastic surgeon, Dr. William Wallace. Thank you so much for joining us today. And also Kathy Partridge, who is a certified permanent cosmetic professional. So uh, let's just jump right in, Dr. Wallace. Um, first question for you, uh, timing. What, what is the best timing uh, following breast cancer for breast reconstruction? Well, there, there are basically two different times that, uh, that breast reconstruction can be done, Rhonda. One is an immediate reconstruction at the same time as a mastectomy. And the second is a delayed reconstruction several months afterwards. Uh, that discussion as to whether uh, a woman, well the first discussion is whether a woman even desires breast reconstruction after a mastectomy. But if she does, then the second question is what is the best timing? And that's a, a question and a discussion that she should have with her general surgeon, the surgeon who's going to be doing the mastectomy. Most of the time they will help her uh, decide what the best timing is. It depends on several factors. Uh, number one, how aggressive they think her disease is and whether or not she is going to need to have radiation therapy or intensive chemotherapy or some other treatment beyond the mastectomy. Uh, because if some of the really aggressive treatments are needed after the mastectomy, it's sometimes better to wait on the reconstruction and get that initial treatment done, especially radiation therapy, and then do the reconstruction. If, however, they think that her disease is fairly limited and is an early disease um, and that she will not need radiation, then it's reasonable to consider doing uh, the reconstruction uh, immediately at the same time as a mastectomy. Okay, and just kind of follow up to that. So then the, the time then really could vary from patient to patient depending on the course of treatment. Exactly, it could. Okay. And, and I don't know that there is any set answer for every patient because every patient is individual. And sometimes they do not know uh, until they do the mastectomy and take out a lymph node in the armpit, what's called a sentinel node uh, biopsy, as to what the extent of the disease is and whether or not they may have to have radiation uh, therapy. Um, and, and other factors go into the decision, uh, such as the age of the patient, uh, the uh, other medical problems, uh, such as diabetes or, or heart conditions or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay, well then, just uh, following up, what, what techniques then are available for breast reconstruction? There are several, uh, and they are, they are pretty much uh, divided as to their complexity. Uh, probably the most straightforward uh, method of, of breast reconstruction is following the mastectomy. The breast has completely been removed. The muscle on the chest wall, which is the pectoralis muscle, is still intact. You can go under that pectoralis muscle and elevate it off of the underlying chest wall. And you can put uh, either a, a straightforward breast implant or a specialized type of breast implant, which is called a tissue expander, into a pocket under the muscle, and then sew up the skin from the mastectomy. And if you're using a tissue expander, you would gradually, over several months, two to three months typically, uh, add fluid to that implant and gradually stretch the muscle and the skin out. And then at a second stage operation, uh, uh, down the road, you would go back and put a final implant. Now, on women who have had radiation or for whatever reason don't have very good muscle coverage on their chest wall, uh, we will, the sort of the next technique is to take a muscle from the back that uh, called a latissimus muscle and leave an, uh, an area of skin attached to that muscle divide it, free it up, and tunnel that muscle through the armpit, bring it around and sew it in on the chest, again putting an implant under it, 
but that gives you better coverage uh, over the implant. Um, and, I th and that's, uh, some people use it, some plastic surgeons use it as their primary method of breast reconstruction. Others use it uh, pretty much in uh, cases where it's indicated, such as radiation or poor skin coverage and all. There's a third type breast reconstruction that's a little bit more involved, and that is to take an area of skin and fatty tissue from the abdomen, leaving it attached to a, a muscle that's in the abdomen, freeing it up, tunneling it up, and bringing it out into the chest to create the, uh, the breast. Uh, the, when this method is called a, it's a it, for a lay term, it's called a TRAM flap, T-R-A-M, but it's a transverse rectus abdominis myocutaneous flap, and <laughs> easier known as a TRAM <laughs> flap. And the TRAM flap was developed probably 15 years ago, and the, the advantage, the theoretical advantage is that many times with a tram flap, if there is enough fatty tissue of the low abdomen on the woman, you don't need to put a, an implant, a, a silicone or a saline breast implant under it. Um, the, on the other side of the coin is that it's a much bigger operation and the recovery time is usually a good bit longer and more involved than the simple putting a breast implant in. So you have to sort of weigh one against the other. All right, so with these various techniques, how does a physician and the patient, how, how do you determine which, take, which of those techniques is the best for a patient? Well, in, in this day and age, uh, even though a woman may have just received the diagnosis that she has breast cancer, within a matter of days, many of them have already gone on the internet, have looked at uh, the different techniques, the possibilities, and have some idea in mind. But uh, the bottom line is that they would see a plastic surgeon, and that plastic surgeon should discuss with them, just like I have have just finished talking about the different techniques. And um, then it's a choice, it's a, it's a decision between the patient and the plastic surgeon. Um, sometimes the, the patient will have a specific idea about what they want and, and most of these uh, techniques, as we've said, there are pros and there are cons. Uh, there are indications for some and not for others. Um, and you really, the plastic surgeon is the one who needs to lead the patient through that decision-making process. And think about the, the pros and cons of the different procedures and then come to a consensus of what they want to do. Well, at, at what point in the process does a woman need to see her plastic surgeon? Is that before the mastectomy? Is it after? Uh, when, when do you suggest that she have that conversation? I think that she need the first conversation obviously is with her general surgeon about the type of treatment that she wants, whether it is a mastectomy or perhaps a lumpectomy and radiation. Obviously with a lumpectomy and radiation, she would have no need to see a plastic surgeon at that point. If the decision is made that she uh, is going to have a mastectomy, then the decision is whether to see the plastic surgeon at that point to talk about an immediate reconstruction or to just wait on a delayed reconstruction. Her general surgeon can help her with that decision, but if there is any question that she wants an immediate reconstruction, then she does need to see her plastic surgeon before the mastectomy. He needs to be part of that planning process for the combined mastectomy and reconstruction. Uh, if the decision is made, or even if they're not sure whether they want to do an immediate or a delayed, it's still a good idea to come and talk to the plastic surgeon before the mastectomy uh, to get an idea about what her options are and then make a decision. That's great. Well, going forward then, uh, you know, big concern, does, does insurance cover breast reconstruction? It does. And one of the things that came out of some of the health care reforms years ago when uh, President Clinton was in office was a, pretty much a federal mandate that insurance companies and Medicare 
cover uh, breast reconstruction and cover ancillary procedures that go with that breast reconstruction, such as nipple reconstruction that Kathy will talk about, and also procedures on the other breast uh, to perhaps make it symmetrical with the reconstructed breast, uh, such as a breast lift or a breast reduction or something like that. Uh, so they pretty much uh, all insurance companies and uh, the government programs all cover breast reconstruction. Oh, well, I know that's very good news for women who are, are confronted with the breast cancer diagnosis yeah. to know that this is, uh, that doesn't have to be a concern. Right. That, that's not part of the, the worry. That's great. Yeah. Well, then talk, talk about how many procedures, you, you kind of hinted at this earlier, some things are staged, how many procedures generally are needed for uh, reconstruction and about how long does that process take? It's almost all of these techniques that I have talked about require at least two procedures, but sometimes three or, or more. But the normal is two. And whether you're doing just a regular tissue expander under the muscle, or if you're doing a latissimus flap from the back, again with a tissue expander, both of those, you're going to gradually add fluid to the, um, to the implant that'll stretch out the muscle and skin. And that, that usually is a process you do it. I, it varies from plastic surgeon to plastic surgeon. I usually see my patients every two weeks and add fluid. Um, and then it generally takes me two and a half to three months to get them stretched out. At that point, I do a second operation. And at that time, I take the tissue expander out and put my final implant in and then also do my nipple reconstruction. Uh, even if you're doing the uh, flap from the abdomen, you might not even have, you might not have a, a, a breast implant involved at all, uh, but you would still want to do a nipple reconstruction if the patient wants it, and you would do that on a delayed basis. Um, years ago, for the nipple reconstruction, we would do something to create the, the little nipple itself, and then we would put a skin graft around the nipple for the areola. Uh, we've pretty much gone completely to Kathy being particip uh, participating in this, and now what we do is at that second operation, we um, will do some little flaps of skin and create a little nipple that sticks up, and once that heals, then turn the patient over to Kathy. Kathy, tell us about uh, what you do in this, this phase of the reconstruction then. Well, I get to do the fun part. They, they have, when they've gotten to me, it's sort of the end of the race. Um, and we may need to address that, because most of the women I'm seeing now are bilaterals. They choose to have the other breast removed as well. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, so, but they're very much involved in the process. Once they're healed from the, the uh, nipple reconstruction, then they come and see me. And even before then, uh, we show them pictures, and I have some of those today. Uh, this is a great, ex this is before and after, and there is a lot of joy when they get off the table and look at themselves in the mirror for the first time because it's like, I'm back. Mm -hmm. um, and these are immediately afterwards. Um, and there again, you can see the surgically created nipple, you can see, see the scars. Mm -hmm. But a lot of times, once you get that color back, the areola tattooing, the focus is no longer. They go from seeing scar-covered mounds to seeing pretty close to normal breasts again. So you add the tattooing and the, the coloring to return to the normal mm -hmm. appearance. All of this is tattooing, all the color. And this is a two-stage process. They will come in and it usually spends about two hours with me the first time. They're very much involved in the color selection. Uh, often at times have to mix pigments to get the color that they desire. And uh, they'll come back in six weeks for a retouch because some of the pigment will follow, fall out the first time. Uh, for example, this is a natural and this one is first stage tattoo. So it's very close to natural, very close to natural. And we, like I said, I have a variety of pigments. They're very much involved in the process. 
uh, of what they want. They and they ha it's a little bit more of a challenge if you're matching an, another nipple. But these days, it seems to me that most women are going ahead and opting to do the bilateral. Mm -hmm. And you get great comments for afterwards. Yes. But if you're doing, if, if a woman is having just a mastectomy on one side, uh, then we try to, at that second operation, try to do a breast lift or a breast reduction or whatever it takes to make the size the same on both sides. And then when Kathy gets them, she will try to match the pigmentation from the natural nipple as closely as possible. Um, but what she and and we do seem to be seeing a fair number of especially younger well I was going to say younger but younger and older women that when they find out they have breast cancer they almost are are interested they're they're eager to just get rid of both breasts mm -hmm. to try to avoid the possibility down the road that they may have uh, developed cancer in the other breast. Right. And, and when you do the bilateral reconstructions, then it's, it makes her job a little bit easier because she doesn't have to match that color. They just choose what color they want and, and do both sides. Mm -hmm. Well, Kathy, tell us um, your training. How, I mean, what is your training for uh, learning how to do this well, cosmetic I'm, tattooing? I'm a nurse by profession, and I've been a nurse for quite some time. But actually, I had to learn how to tattoo um, eyeliner, eyebrows, and lips. I went to, I took additional courses to learn to do the Arela tattooing. And I've been doing that for about five years now. Mm -hmm. Well, it sounds like for women who have a, you know, the very alarming and um, breast cancer diagnosis, there are great, great options for getting their lives back on course after that disease, so. And, and you're looking at a total process from the time of mastectomy if you do an immediate reconstruction of probably four months to six months but hopefully within six months you would have them pretty much over the whole process now they may be undergoing chemotherapy during that period of time also but there are times i think you said that there it might be a, a, a choice to maybe to to wait till they're through with chemo or is it pretty much just waiting till radiation is over well if they're going to have if, if they're going to have uh, an, ex, an aggressive chemo program that maybe one or two, a, or two or three agents and it's going to be, you know, hard on them, then I'd rather wait until they, they get over it. Uh, so to me, radiation or multiple uh, uh, agent chemotherapy, I think you're probably better off waiting. Uh, what worries me with, especially with the aggressive chemotherapy programs, and protocols is that their uh, white count can drop down. They're a little bit more likely to have in problems with infection, and and you don't want to be doing the work on their uh, implants and different things. You know that they possibly could get infected. So you wait until they're over with that. If it is a pretty straightforward uh, uh, mastectomy and maybe one type of chemotherapy agent, then I, I think I'm I'm okay with that. So again, it's a case by case basis, but there is the there is the it might be related to the stage, and it's just related to the course of treatment. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. But the point is that there is definitely a great light at the end of the tunnel, no matter how long that tunnel might be. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Well, thank you both for coming today and for this great information for our breast cancer patients and for the, the light at the end of the tunnel and the hope that you have given women that are going to undergo this, these procedures just to know that the breast reconstruction can be so, so good. So thank you for that. You're and thank welcome. you for joining us today. We hope that you'll come back for our future webcast. Thank you.